be good. Take notes. Take out your pens and your paper. You will be blessed. Come on up, brother. I uh, wanted to mention something. I don't know how you handle your prayer request things, but uh, back in 82 when we came here, I came with a fellow named Jim Ivey, and many of you know that, and I don't know how many of you know it, but Jim is not in good health at all. He has bone cancer, and he cannot walk. Uh, it's that bad. So I know I've talked to his girls quite a bit the last few months, and I would appreciate you praying for him. All right, and uh, it's got to be difficult, difficult on them. Uh, and I have his address in Oregon. I was going to go and see him, but they got these stupid regulations there. That if I go to Oregon, I got to quarantine for 14 days, and then I got to come back and quarantine for 10 more days. I can't take a month off, so uh, just pray for Jim. I would appreciate it. Second Kings chapter number six. Second Kings chapter number six. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there, where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee. Go with thy servant. And he answered, I will go. So we went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. And as one of was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water. And he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore, said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand. And took it. Father, I pray now that you'll anoint your word. Anoint this preacher one more time. Speak to hearts. Revive this church. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I told your pastor earlier, I believe 99.9% .9 of all independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist churches are dead churches. This passage of scripture reminds me of many churches I know of today. They have lots of activity. Everybody is busy. Everyone was doing good things. Many were doing the right things. They were enlarging their ministry. Every night of the week was filled with something but all the efforts did not produce even one soul for the kingdom of God. They were running buses. They had Sunday school classes every Sunday. The Wednesday night service was well attended. They even had a good visitation program. But the mourner's bench was empty. The baptismal waters were calm for the most part. And it's so picturesque of the numerous Baptist churches across America today. Action, but no unction. Sounds, but no souls. Soul winning conventions but no soul winning commitments. Strong on attendance, but silent on absolutes. Proclaiming recreation, but omitting repentance. 
any or all of these signs or symptoms describe what I'm calling tonight a dead church. Just because the church has choir practice, specials, ushers, hmm, does not mean that they're alive. Does not mean that they're exempt from being considered a dead church. In verse 4 of our scripture, we see a group of workers cutting down trees. And all at once realized the instrument used for chopping down trees had disappeared. The axe head was gone. They still had the handle, but nothing was happening. What a sad state to be in. The Lord Jesus reminded the church at Ephesus to remember therefore from when thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. Hmm. I think God is tired of Christians playing church. Everybody doing churchy things, but only a few are doing what builds a church. By the way, I don't know if you know it or not, only one thing builds a church. Souls. Okay? Souls. People getting saved. Hmm. You don't build churches with part-time help and pocket change. If your part of this work is dead, then I want to give you some principles that will revive a dead church, a dead ministry or a dead individual Christian. I wonder how many Christians are going to stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ where Christians go with their heads hung in shame because they did nothing. They, uh, Dr. Bragg used to say they, they get saved to sit. And that's all they ever do. They come to church and they sit there. They're like bird, little baby birds in a nest. You got to force feed them stuff, but they never do anything with it. Hmm. So, some principles for reviving a dead church. Number one, every member should be involved in the ministry of this church. Hmm. Verse 2 says, And take thence every man a beam. Let everybody get involved. See, the work of any church is too great for one individual to do everything. So get off the bench, get in the action, get to work. You are needed here. Amen. Normally, the workforce in any church is made up of about 10% of the membership. Well, who do you work for? What's the name of the company? Kinetic. What would they do if 10% of all the work at Kinetic was done by 10% of the people? Think about that for a moment. What about Ford Motor Company? All the cars that got put together, 10% of the workforce did the work. Everybody else just sat around and did nothing. I wonder how many jobs would be available where you work. Hmm. No business that I know of can function on 10% of the workforce. That's what's happened over the last two years. Businesses all over Riverton, Wyoming are closed down. Or they're only open part-time. And they all say the same thing. They've got big old help wanted sides outside. And then a sign under it said, we cannot find staff to keep operating our business. Hmm. Can't do it with part-time crew takes a whole staff yet the church is supposed to perform and reach the entire community with 90% of its workforce doing nothing but sitting and getting fed it won't work and you know it won't work every adult here should be an active in, I don't know how many of you are, but 
but you ought to be active in Sunday school. It ought to be as bad to you to miss Sunday school as it is to miss church. Or to miss a revival meeting. Hmm. I wonder what your Sunday school would be like if everybody came. And Sunday school was just as important as the morning service or the evening service. It ought to be. Huh. What about teenagers? Are they active in Sunday school? Hmm. If we're going to have a thriving, God-pleasing, soul-winning church, then you must have participation by every member of Good News Baptist Church. If not, it's dead. You must... Secondly, remember what your purpose is. Verse 2, and let us make us a place there. Jesus organized the New Testament church to go out in the world and fulfill Matthew chapter 28. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's the job of the church. I wonder how many other churches in this town are going around preaching the gospel to the people in town. I know when I was here, it was a matter of nobody went out and knocked on doors. When we did it, people were like, you can't do that stuff. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I did. <laughs> Rome and I went to crazy places. He always took me and I was dog bait so he could knock on the doors. Because he knew I was scared to death of them dogs. <laughs> Probably could back then. But I carried a big knife just in case. His dad was the same way. He wasn't afraid of no dogs. He'd jump over the fat and these rottweilers would come running up and they would just ignore Bert and come to me. And I'd just trying to get back in the truck alive. Huh. What's our purpose? A church building, and stay with me here because I'm going to mess some of your brains up is not to be limited as a place of worship. Worship is a private experience between a believer and God. It can be done in a public place. And it can be done in a church building. It can be done at home in your closet. It can be conducted while you're driving your truck all day long. You can worship with God. By the way, you guys have a lot of times you travel. I mean, you, you got it worse than I do. I'm only 14 miles from the church. 14 miles from town. We have a Walmart. We have restaurants. We have stores. you got to go 100 miles to go anywhere. That means you got two hours that you can worship God in your car. Hmm. But the church building is not purposed for worship. A believer does not need to be present with other believers in order to worship. He can, if he chooses to, but it's not absolutely necessary. We shouldn't designate this building as only a worship sanctuary. If you do that, you limit its purpose. Yes. It is not a rest home for saints. Amen. Isn't that what most churches are? Every church, excuse me, every saint of God should feel, how do I want to say this? Comfortable and homey when he comes to church. Hmm. It's not a place of rest and retirement. You ought to come here and want to fellowship with each other. Make it a... By the way, you know, the more you fellowship, the less problems you're going to have. You'll get to know each other. And you won't be talking about each other. You'll be... In my church, you can ask Rome, he just came back from here. We do a lot of hugging. 
Think about that now. I mean, Rome was going, man, all these women hugging me. But of course, the lady's six foot six, and he's not going to say nothing to her. She does carry a gun. I have quite a few of them by ladies carry guns. Plus, my son carries a gun. And Mr. Allen carries a gun. So, huh. so why do you do that? They had all them people. They were attacking churches. And they decided they're going to attack us. We're going to be ready for it. Hmm. Listen to me. Oftentimes, older members get grumpy and upset when a consistent program for bringing new people is used. Some people don't want new people. They like it just like it is. Don't want to have... By the way, if you don't get new people, then you've lost your vision of what a church is all about. It's kind of hard to get people saved and you're all saved. You say, well, we're not all saved. But I don't know that. And now you can only listen to so many salvation messages and realize, I ain't going back there because I know I'm saved and he's going to say the same thing over again. Don't get me wrong. I never get tired of a salvation message. But we're to preach the whole counsel of God. There are other things in here. See, they seem to lose their identity because there's so many young people running around in excitement. They lose their prestige. Hmm. It should not happen, but it does. What is the problem? Why do we need a church or a church building? To carry out the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. By the way, who was that written to? You. Me. How many of you going around the world taking the gospel? Hmm. Rome said, I would go, but he hadn't been there. Been to China lately? They, uh, I got a missionary in uh, that place of Russia uh, entered today. The Ukraine. You been there? By the way, does this say you are to go there and teach all nations? Hmm. How do you do it? Through your local church and a mission program of your local church? Hmm. Reaching the lost. See, our church should be a maternity ward for babes in Christ. And they're not for the most part. See, the church is the vehicle by which we can carry the gospel to your city and to the world. If we went on the streets and into homes without the organization of a church institution, you wouldn't succeed. You go there, try and invite them to church. Hmm. The church saves no one. The person does not go to heaven because he is a member of a local New Testament church. But the church is where we pool all of our efforts together for the cause of Christ to get people saved. Hmm. And then after they get saved, teaching them how to grow up. The Bible calls it discipleship. You know, teach them that you should read your Bible every day. That you should pray every day. By the way, when I got saved, I'm going to be honest with you, I had no earthly idea what a tithe was. If you'd have asked me, I'd have said, I don't know, I guess it's some fancy necktie or something. I had no idea. Somebody had to teach me. I didn't know you read your Bible every day. I didn't know you prayed in the morning, prayed in the afternoon, and prayed in the evening. Didn't know any of it. I had a disciple. I had a man in my home church that I looked up to. He was an FBI agent. His name is John Elliott. And he took me under his wing. And he took me out on a bus ministry. Here's an FBI agent that has to carry a gun with him no matter where he went. Because of his position. 
and yet he was out winning little kids on a bus ministry, bringing in 100 kids on Sunday mornings on a bus. Why? So they would get saved. And when they got saved, you know what he would do? He'd weep. He'd cry because one little black kid got saved. We need to have some training sessions in our churches. Some one-on-one Bible studies. You have men in this church. You've got a pastor. You've got an evangelist. Amen. All you have to do is say, look, can we have a Bible study? I'm having some problems in this area. By the way, this message is because something you said the other day. He started talking about them people with their axe head. And that brought about this message. Hmm. If we are not accomplishing our purpose, then we are missing the boat or we are dead. Every ministry of your church should be involved in soul winning. If it isn't, change it or drop it. Hmm. Your Sunday school should be reaching the lost. I tell our folks, our kids in the Sunday school class, you know what they do after Sunday school's over? They come up in the auditorium and they take up the offering and then they're dismissed to junior church. The only gospel they ever hear is what's taught in Sunday school and junior church. They're not there to hear me. And a lot of them kids, the only time they ever come is on Sunday mornings. On the church van. So if we're not trying to win them to Christ in Sunday school, they can come to church until they're 10 years old, 15 years old, and leave and never, ever get anything different. What's our problem? Number three, we've lost the axe head. It says in verse five, but as one was felling a beam, The axe head fell in the water and he cried and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. I think the axe head is kind of symbolic of the Holy Spirit. The axe head was the source of power for what they were doing. Without the axe head, all was meaningless motions. Imagine cutting down trees with an axe handle and no axe head. Swinging the handle did not cut down one tree. Wouldn't do it. See, the handle was not that important. It could be nice and shiny, polished, or it could be an ugly old stick. It didn't matter. But it was worthless without the axe head. You know, you and Christians without the leading of the Holy Spirit are worthless. I told you the other day, your pastor needs time to prepare. And that's not putting notes down it's preparing his soul what do you want me to preach God what is it you want me to say by the way that takes time that takes as much time as preparing the message now the handle was not important Our programs are representative of the handle. You want and need good programs. But they don't have to be perfect. You can get so wrapped up in what kind of handle you use that you forget where the power is, the accent, or in our case, the Holy Spirit. I've got a couple of preachers. Did you ever preach a message and say, man, I've this isn't what I wanted to do. And then you preach it and it's like, oh man, that's going to be a flop. That's useless. And then the altar's full. And people are getting saved and you're going, I don't believe it. You know why? Because you were listening to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit tells you what to do. See, our programs are just a representation of the handle. I'm afraid too many institutions 
bearing the name of Jesus Christ are swinging axe handles. And they have no heads. The axe head's been lost. Holy Spirit power's gone. By the way, something else I noticed there too. He lost the axe head while using it. Hmm. By the way, you know what that does? That, that kind of warns us of the need to always be ready and expecting an attack from the, the devil. My pastor used to say the first person in this church every Sunday morning is the Satan. I guarantee you he's at every church service. He wants problems. He stirs up problems. Just because a person may be swinging a handle does not mean they are doing a good work for God. A handle without an axe head is not a tool. It's a hindrance. A Christian without the leading of the Holy Spirit is just a empty handle. See, swinging that handle without the axe head does nothing. And doing the work for God without the Holy Spirit guiding you does nothing for God. Any person doing the work for the Lord without the power of the Spirit of God is the same as that handle without an axe head. By the way, that's what I want when I have people come and preach at my church. I'm very limited who I let come. Because I want to know that they're spirit-filled and spirit-led. And the only reason they're there is to have the Holy Spirit do something. I had this famous evangelist come in every year. And I say famous, he is... I can show you the sword of the Lord right now. He's at every conference in America. And he came a couple years and they put him up in a hotel and he had to, he had to fly in on his own ticket. And then I had to reimburse him for whatever he came. And I could get him, he was coming from Detroit, Michigan. And I could get him a plane flight for $340. He said, no, I want to do it with my end. Cost me $885. And at the time we were rebuilding the, uh, Apartment in the barn where my son lives. And I told him, I said, Well, next year when you come, we're going to put you out, the, we're gonna, I'm going to put you in the barn this day because it's a lot cheaper. You know what he said? I want to stay there. I like that hotel you put me in. They got an exercise room. I said, I got 30 acres. You can run around all you want. I got a horse. You can get on him and ride. You know what? He never came back. You know what I had there for a couple years? A handle with no axe head. Oh, he's a great preacher. Got the great stories. Can keep you on the edge of your seat. But it was a business to him. So what's our answer? How do we get the dead church back to life? First thing he did is admitted... He had lost the axe head. He cried. (laughs) Some of you do not have what you once had spiritually. You have lost your power. And yet most of you won't admit it. Many of you can used to go to Sunday school every week. Never missed. Some of you never miss soul winning. And I don't mean just visiting those that are sick or somebody shut in. I'm talking about going out with the purpose of trying to get people saved. Hmm. I can remember when you used to bring people to church. Walk them down the aisle weekly. What's happened? You've lost your power. You don't have it no more. By the way, I'm talking to me as well as you. If I point my finger out there to three, I'm pointing back at me. He also realized that it was borrowed. 
See, the power of the Holy Spirit is barred. We can't have the power of God if we don't use it right. God will not allow us to go out here and live just any way we want to live and then pour out his power upon us. We got to live right. He won't use a dirty vessel. You got to make sure you're clean. I say, you're talking to preachers. No, I'm talking to everybody. See, if this church is going to accomplish what it needs to accomplish for the cause of Christ, all of you need to be right. All of you need to have the axe head on the end of the handle. You may have had the power of God in your life at one time, but that does not guarantee that it's there for all time. Remember when you came to the altar and God was speaking to you? And then do you remember coming to the altar because everybody else was doing it? Hmm. He admitted he has lost it. He cried. He realized it was borrowed. And he, here's the good part, I think. He knew who to go to. He cried to the master. What you need is some good old-fashioned repentance. A time when you allow God to take the spiritual surgical instrument and start cutting away that foreign growth that hinders your fulfilling the will of God for your life and the life of this church. Hmm. See, he realized his answer was found in the master. He noticed it was a... He had a new handle in it now. He, The master, remember, he cut down the stick and threw it in the water and the stick did swim, or the axe head did swim. Swim where? To that old stick that he made, the, the master threw in. I wonder why the word stick was used. Wooden receptacle or, or tool sound kind of better. Stick seems kind of crude, doesn't it? I think it was used to show us the unimportance of the stick and the importance of the swimming of the axe head. See, the stick was representative of a person wanting the power of God in their lives. Hmm. Now he could do the work again. Lastly, and I'm almost done tonight, he took it back by faith. The master said, therefore, take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. You know, God wants to do something supernatural in your life. Not only saving your soul, you're saved, you're going to heaven. That's, that's settled. But God is more concerned with filling us with this Holy Spirit. That we can be about the Master's work. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. You don't have to turn there. I'm going to read a couple verses to you. It said, if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit... To them that ask him. When's the last time you asked God to fill you with the Holy Spirit? Amen. By the way, that Holy Spirit never leaves you. But most of us has quenched that spirit. It's been so long since we heard from him. It's like he's not there no more. Luke 24, 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father unto you. But tarry ye here in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. It's the last time you spent a night at the altar of your church asking for nothing but the power of God on your life. Hmm. Acts chapter 1. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women 
and Mary the mother of Jesus and with the brethren. Prayer and supplication together. Acts 2, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. By the way, the Bible, does, does your Bible say this? Maybe I got a misprint here. Doesn't my Bible say he's the same yesterday, today, and forever? He's going to do the same thing. Ephesians 5.18, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. When's the last time you did something and you know you did it only because the Holy Spirit told you to do it? Preach a message that you didn't want to preach because the Holy Spirit told you to do it. Went and knocked on a door that you didn't want to knock on. Or you wanted to put some money in the plate that you didn't know why it was going in there. But the Holy Spirit told you to do it. If the apostles required the filling of the Holy Spirit of God to fulfill the call of God in their lives, why should you and I expect anything less? Why do we do everything in the flesh? Hmm. See, to be not filled with the Spirit of God is sin. By the way, I'm saying this to preachers. To preach a message that God did not tell you to preach is sin. Mm-mm. But I like that message. It's got all my good stories in it. You know, people don't really want to hear your stories. It's faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hmm. I've been around some preachers, boy, they could tell stories. They have you sitting there, have you laughing so hard you'd almost wet yourself. And the next minute you're crying. That's not the Holy Spirit. No. Word of God. Do you need to repent of the sin of not being filled with the Spirit of God? Hmm. By the way, look around you. Look how many people are missing tonight. You know, you could just spend tomorrow picking up the phone and say, boy, we missed you in church last night. Tomorrow's the last night. The evangelist is gone. Morgan's going to be out of here. You may not see him ever again. be honest with you, back in September, I didn't think you were ever going to see me again. Nobody else thought you were ever going to see me again. Until we got to heaven, that is. Because I knew where I was going. And at my age, I'm 39, you know, I could go at any time. And nothing else for lying. <laughs> there is a need. The church is dead. Hmm. Do I have to say anything else? Or is it time for you to get serious? Examine your heart. And see if the Holy Spirit's guiding and directing. Tell you what, if the Spirit of God's directing, don't have to worry about any of you that are here. You'll be here tomorrow night. Won't have a problem with that. And if the Spirit of God leads you, you'll know exactly who you need to talk to when you can bring them with you. Hmm. By the way... I've, have you ever, I know this probably never happened to you, but it's happened to me quite often. I've been riding through town and the Lord would say, I want you to go and knock on that door. And I'll knock on that door and a person will come to that door and say, you know, I've been waiting for you. They didn't know me. And I didn't know them. But God's Holy Spirit said it's time. And they were standing there waiting. I'll tell you their names even, Jerry and Florine Cox. Hmm. The Lord said, go and visit them. And then I did. And that day, Jerry got saved. And by the way, he thought he was a good Episcopal Christian. 
And by the way, he'd been coming to church pretty regularly. But I listened to the Holy Spirit, and guess what? He's in heaven today. Huh. His wife, Romo, remember, got saved up at our camp. Like, that was a year I said, if you're saved, every person saved ought to have a verse in the Word of God that showed them what Christ did. If not, you're not saved. And I use faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. And you're born again, not of corruptible, but of incorruptible. I can remember that lady, 80 years old, running across the camp. I went down to feed my critters. I come up the next morning. She's running across the camp. I found it, preacher. I found it. That night, she had found a verse. And she got saved. All because you listened to the Holy Spirit. Who's the Holy Spirit wants you to talk to tonight or tomorrow to fill this building up? Let's pray. Every head bowed and every eye closed. No one looking around. Just quietly examine your own heart. Has God spoken to any of you tonight? Say, preacher, would you pray for me? I'll not come. I'll not approach you. But I would like to know how to pray. God has spoken to my heart to some things that I need to do to help our church. I see that hand. I see that hand. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. Let's stand together. Father, I pray now that your Holy Spirit would have liberty in my heart and the hearts of these, your people. Lord, I know you want a great revival at Good News. But it won't happen until we come back to life. We've been dead for a long time. Restore unto us the joy of thy salvation. Let the Holy Spirit have liberty. Knock on our heart's door again. Help us to know you're still out there talking to us. And we'll thank you for it. I'm going to have Miss Sam play an invitation song. The altar's open. If you need to come, just come.